Bills win and Tua is out. That's really the major headline. So we'll discuss his history and what's next. We've got Jason Kelsey on retirement and being busy and the Eagles and offensive line stuff that I'm trying to get better at. And Ryan Day, so an awesome show today, the head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes on another year expectations and bringing in Chip Kelly and how they want to recruit at Ohio State. We've got the Alliance and Life Advice. So last night wasn't a lot of fun. I imagine if you're a Bills fan, it was a lot of fun. But we'll talk a little bit about the game. And then the biggest headline, too, is concussion and some quick thoughts. So Bills win 31-10. Not much of a game. 24-10. Third and five. Miami has the football at their own 30. A terrible decision by Tua. Throws a pick six to Jamarcus Ingram. Game's over. From Buffalo. Uh, Ingram wasn't really supposed to even be a major factor. Uh, Both sides dealt with injuries. Uh, Clearly, again, I get to the Tua part here. Ingram only played on 30% of the snaps. Um, Looking at the line going in, Miami favored by two and a half. I wondered if it was impacted at all by Allen's left hand, which he hurt on that touchdown run where he basically elbow dropped his own hand into the end zone. And you could tell post-celebration, we had mentioned this on Monday's pod, you could just see immediately like, I'm going to celebrate this big touchdown, but man, something hurts. And so he's got this thick, almost like motocross glove on his left hand, and then the middle two fingers are taped together. So you would wonder how that would impact them, and it didn't matter at all. Allen threw six pass attempts in the second half. They didn't need him. Bill's rushing attack was terrific in the first half, eight yards per carry. It actually felt like Miami moved the football throughout the night, which is the frustrating part of how things played out. And again, there's a lot that's really frustrating about this for Dolphins fans. Um, The reason I feel like they moved the football is because they did. I mean, 351 total yards, but they were one of five on fourth downs, and they had the three interceptions. And it also felt like within the flow of the game when they needed that big play, and I'm not talking about yardage and a deep shot. I'm just talking about like the, the, the play that gets them seven, the play that extends the drive, that they would move the ball a little bit. A-chan I thought was terrific uh, with their running back shuffle. I mean, Miami is a talented football team, and yet when they really needed it to matter, it didn't happen. On the three interceptions, uh, the first one was a tip ball completely on the receiver, not to his fault. The second interception where he throws it over the head of Chosen, originally I thought it was a bad ball. Looked at it again this morning. It may have been a bad route. I don't know. You can find strong arguments for both one. The third one is inexcusable. It's Will Levis stuff. You can't in that spot. I mean, forget score, forget down a distance. I mean, he's just trying to throw it off to the left side, like blindly. And Ingram runs it back for a second pick of the game. So Tua actually, even though we could, the first pick is not on him. The second one, I guess, can be debated a bit. Uh, He wasn't great last night. He airmailed a throw to his left that was just like when an NFL quarterback, like one that's good to really good, when they airmail something, it, it always feels like it stands out a little bit more to me. He had a throw in the end zone where he missed a touchdown. And as much as the concussion from last night sucks, you know what he was trying to do down 31-10 is give his team any chance at hope. I mean, that was a, a, that was a football player trying to find anything that could happen on fourth and four. They're at the Bills 13. He scrambles up. He's got the first down. He collides into DeMar Hamlin, who's upright. Tua's head gets just turned one side. And as soon as he's down, his arm is up. And you're watching it at home going, on now. Like this, we've seen this one before. The irony part of the DeMar Hamlin storyline, I wondered if they would bring it up. Al Michaels did bring it up. And by the way, everybody was all over it. Um, Tua's history with concussions. So go back to 22, he had one week three against the Bills and then was cleared four days later. And there was a lot of talk about this at the time because there's this process that you have to go through to be cleared. And there's also an independent neurologist. And we all know what happened Thursday night football, four days later against Cincinnati. He's smashed to the ground. And then he's in the fencing pose, and and now it's like, I can't believe this guy was cleared. 
I believe the union pushed to have that neurologist fired. Um, and it may be easy to kind of forget too, because that hit was so awful to watch that remember he had concussion symptoms. That was the quote from Miami during the week 16 Green Bay game. And he didn't play in week 17, week 18. And then ultimately, as we know, like Miami had backups in a quarterback for their playoff loss. So going into 23, and by the way, he had another one at Bama too. So going into 23, two was doing interviews. I think it was with Levitard where they got the great answer from him, where he had talked pretty openly about how he had considered retiring. And it wasn't so much him wanting to do it. It was his mother. But then he got into a different kind of off-season regimen. He said he had bulked up. He had taken jujitsu, And that was also helping him learn how to fall. Like, I hear that a lot with guys. And by the way, martial arts, all for it. But, you know, you can practice all sorts of stuff. But when somebody who's a lot bigger and stronger than you smashes into you, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know what kind of stuff you could do. You can talk about getting stronger and your core and all these different things. But when you're a smaller quarterback, you're just more susceptible to this stuff. So last night turned into retirement talk for Tua because clearly he's going to get all of his money and it's a lot if he doesn't want to play again. Des Bryant chimed in, Shannon Sharp, a lot of content this week. Mitchell Schwartz, our buddy, you know, was was thoughtful in the way that he was like, you know, the moment essentially today you may think that coming back to football is your priority, but like anything, youth versus becoming old and just thinking back to how little you cared about some of the decisions you were making and then maybe having regrets later on in life, right? Um, AB got in there when he wasn't talking about female preparation of political candidates. He then throws us a T's and P's after about seven jokes on Tua. So, and this is the part where I feel bad about how Tua will be talked about. Like, I'll feel bad for Tua because generally history tells us that he'll be cleared and he'll probably play football again. And if Tua wants to come back and play football, should all of us tell him that he shouldn't? I don't really feel like it's a zag. It just, like, it sucks enough for what two is going through. And then it's not like he's going to go get released from the hospital and be like, all right, time to check my mentions. <laughs> you know, I don't think he would want to do that. But I always have a problem with just, the mass is moving in one direction where everybody's just decided on a Thursday night that Tua should never play football again. And maybe, by the way, maybe everybody's right. And maybe the former players, the people that did it, that know how they feel post-playing, maybe they're all right and I'm wrong for having any hope that he would play football again. So I'm always going to have a problem with that. It's also the prime time part of it. Last night's game, the other game two years ago, everybody's watching it. We know the history. Uh, I do think, and I've said this before, that because of the success of Drew Brees as a smaller quarterback, because of the success of Russell Wilson, a smaller quarterback, but I always felt like Russell's body type was more um, more prepared. I just felt like he was a thicker guy, you know, that baseball core that allowed him, and he was just so athletic that that maybe he was going to hold up a little bit better than some of the other smaller quarterbacks. But I feel like that is influence for an office is to just think anybody that's small now can come into the league and play. And some guys' height and weight can be the same, but it doesn't mean they have the same bodies. Like Bryce just looks incredibly small. And we already knew that all last year. And I don't know if it's the only reason he's played so poorly through his rookie year in week one. Kyler, who's probably has the arm talent of anyone in the league. When I watch that Bills game, barely getting touched, falling down, I'm always worried he's going to be hurt again. I mean, Jaden Daniels is 6'3", 210, but he's skinny. Washington ran a keeper with him where they ran like power week one. <laughs> and meanwhile, he's running around all over the place and can't slide. I'm like, now you guys are running like a power QB keeper? where he's just going to run into all these people. 
And Jalen Hurts is different because we know that he squats. If you watch a football game without Jalen Hurts squat footage, have you watched a football game? But even he got dinged up a couple times last year. So yeah, I I think any of us that watch this game every weekend have a lot of sympathy for Tua, but this is going to be, I would imagine, a probably pretty predictable timeline of him getting cleared and then coming back, and then what happens? Like, are you are you going to think that he should never play again? I mean, maybe some of you do. I'm sure some of you do. I know some of you do, and maybe you're right with this, but I, I guess I always feel like I always will push back a little bit on that if the player decides I want to try to go back out there. And maybe I'm totally wrong. So the Bills now have won 12 of 13 against the Dolphins. Allen against the Blitz this season is 9 of 11 with three touchdowns. And it didn't even matter with the hand thing because I think the hand thing is still something you're going to be thinking about, but it was just a complete non-factor uh, because of the turnovers and domination. And again, I just thought that I think Cook is one of the most underrated running backs in the NFL. Um, some other good notes here from Buffalo. Vaughn Miller, his fastest pressure numbers since the 21 season. His win rate so far this season is at 33%. It was 15% last year. I don't know if Vaughn Miller at this stage of his career is going to be able to keep up that kind of pace. I doubt it. But I loved what they told us during the broadcast and that Miller goes, at this stage of my life, I just got to get there. I can't be sitting here trying to fight with these 300-pound plus tackles you know, as an older player, like just try to find a way to get there as quick as I possibly can. Uh, and then on the other side, on top of the Tua uncertainty, you have Mike McDaniel, who's now 1-11 in in his last 12 games against teams with a winning record. This is exciting. I think the last time I got to see him or spend a long time with him, there was a couple of brief encounters. Jason Kelsey uh, was with Chris Long back on his podcast, who joins us on behalf of Kingsford right. uh, and a part of ESPN's Monday Night Countdown crew. What's up, man? Good to see you. What's up? How are you doing, Marcelo? Good to see you again. Uh, I'm good. You know, I'm sure you've already been asked the same question, a million different versions. And I actually love the GQ thing that you did because the headline was perfect. It's like, who becomes more famous once they're done playing professional sports? But you, <laughs> you have, whatever the comps were, you have destroyed yeah. the comps. What, what has this been like? Like, what's the most real way you can talk about, like, the craziness of what your life is now? Um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to, it's happened fast but it's also been kind of gradual like i don't really know how to explain it i mean the, the biggest thing is like it's it's just been crazy like i don't really you know there's a perfect storm of like my brother and i start this podcast and then that's having success and then we just so happened the first year of that to make it to the super bowl um and then that puts it on a whole nother platform and then my mom's out there and then all of a sudden my brother starts dating the most famous person probably in the entire world <laughs> and so that's putting our family out to an even another demographic of people um so all of these things happening have just led to just this uh insane uh i guess uh appetite for information and and and, and news involving my family and it's been interesting it's been great uh, in a lot of ways and also uh kind of um intrusive to say the least in others but i think for the most part it's been great yeah what i do think works and i and i mean this not that you know we're super close but i have enough friends that are friends with you that have been raving about you for years and yeah. i think the amazon part of it too of getting the chance for us to peek into your life is that what's working is that it's so genuine like sure yeah. there's the brother side of it but there's a part of it with you where it's it's almost hard to be the humble old lineman because everybody just assumes they're all this. But once we actually like get to know you a little bit more intimately, I think that's where it's like, hey, I'm rooting for this kind of person. And I think that's yeah. what's clicked for you. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, I'm trying to remain that way. Um, yeah, I, I think trying to just be myself is what I'm always trying to do. And, um, you know, the offensive line position by nature, I think 
you can't survive. It's hard to survive as an offensive lineman if you do take yourself way too seriously and you're like this larger than life. Like, you know, I think that for the most part, the offensive line room will do a really good job of humbling you if you get a little bit too big for your britches. So it's uh, it's definitely I think that some of that is just the nature of the position for sure. Yeah, I was listening. I think it was you and Chris and it was it was Lane. It was Jordan. And it was really good. I was I was actually road tripping out in Canada. So I kept throwing on the episodes and I listened to that one start yeah. to finish. And I'm thinking like, you know, here's Jordan with his crazy story. And then Dude. Lane is made out of a lab and then <laughs> your, your entire deal. And yeah. I just all I could think of was one. I was incredibly jealous because I was like, it must be awesome to have like teammates in your 30s <laughs> yeah right don't, right yeah um but but i do think that there's there's a real part of like the success and failures of teams of making sure the guys that have already been there are telling the new guys this is how we do things and for sure and i think it's it's a super easy thing to say but it's a harder thing to execute it's a harder thing to execute and it takes those guys got to be special guys and i think like when we won the super bowl we were really fortunate to get chris long and we had malcolm jenkins was already on the team and we had tory smith and having those veteran pieces that have already climbed the mountaintop and have seen a lot of different you know not just teams but like players and like pitfalls of players and it's really important to have a guy that in, in most of the part in each room that can connect with everybody and that people are gravitated to and that they respect his opinion and that whatever he says is coming from the right place. And um, We were really fortunate in Philly to have that for a long time. And you're right. I mean, one of the things I'm missing most not being in right now is like you don't have the teammates and you're not in the room and everybody says that's the thing you're going to miss the most. And no matter how many people say it, um, for me at least, like it's so much more apparent once it's finally gone that like, man, I just like miss talking to these guys. I miss being around them and the camaraderie of that. Like it's, it's definitely something that I think is taken for granted by a lot of guys that are in the league still. And, uh, you know, people on teams. Was this a tough week going into week one for you? It was, it was a, it was a tough week. I like, I feel like I like panic live tweeted the whole game because it was like a distraction for me. Like I like look back, I'm like, why the why the heck did I just tweet the entire time? <laughs> like, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was it was a weird one to sit there and watch all the guys go out there, and um, and then it was also you know weird to see myself, you know, on Monday Night Countdown and like it, it was it's a it all kind of like hit full head this past week. And it's going to probably even magnify that much more this week, Monday night football uh, being in Philadelphia for sure. Okay. So the media role. All right. Um, yeah. I've, I've worked with a lot of guys mm -hmm. and you know, as soon as somebody's done, they'll have assumptions about how they're going to do it. And sometimes they execute it. Sometimes it takes the season. You know, it's there's all sorts of different paths for the post playing career transition into it. What are you trying to balance? Where I'm like, man, I want to have something good to say, but I just played with these guys, or yeah. I just played against this guy. Like, how are you handling? I don't want to be a dude who's now in the media who's just ripping all of these guys all the time, but I also don't want to be the guy that's just protecting everybody because I just retired. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean. That's the fine line that you're kind of walking. I think the biggest thing for me is like, again, like just being honest. And I think, I think that there's a way to criticize guys that you're being honest and you're, it's hard to, for a guy to be that mad if it's an honest assessment that isn't like a disrespectful way of being said. Right. Like, I think that as a player, you know, where that line is of like, man, this guy's just like, going over the top towards a guy. Whereas it's like, Hey, like, listen, Jalen Hurts had a lot of really good throws this week. He also had a couple of throws that were really bad that cost him some turnovers and those are correctable. So I think that like you saying like an obviously like apparent truth is not disrespectful in my opinion. And I think that when you say it from a place of like, you know, I want, you know, either my former teammate or I want, you know, Lane Johnson, or I want, uh, you know, 
uh, who am I thinking, you know, Baker Mayfield, whoever, if I want them to actually play better, I'm genuinely happy for them. Like when you have those like moments of like, Hey, I'm not just a curmudgeon. I love this game and I love when guys are executing it well. And then you also have the moments where it's like, man, I just wish that they would have got to this, or if they just did a little bit of motion, it would have messed up this aspect of it. I think, um, I think that's kind of how I'm trying to approach it is like, you know, genuinely be excited and just be honest in my assessments. And at the end of the day, if somebody does get upset, like I can sleep at night if what I said was true and in a respectful manner that I think is within the realm of a fair criticism. I I think the Eagles, yeah, you're right. And I I think you're, I think the basis of what you're trying to say too, and it was the same thing for us who didn't play is that you don't want to make it personal, right? Right. And when I'm younger, less of a filter, you start getting older, all the players are younger than you. And you're like, you know what? I don't want to be a dick, you know? Right. And I still may have that in me every now and then, but you want to avoid, at least for me, especially without the kind of resume you guys have, you're like, you don't want to be on Monday night countdown being like, these guys quit three weeks ago. You know, that's the kind of stuff where you're just starting to call out somebody's manhood and their pride. Yeah, exactly. I think that, yeah. And it, and I don't think that the, like, that doesn't offer, there's not that much insight into saying a comment like that. I think that like, maybe you can question, uh, you know, when, when losses pile up, it's human nature that there's going to be more like infighting. And I don't know. I think that questioning manhood and stuff like that, I mean, listen, if, if it's out there, you got to say something about it. But I think that by and large, most of the guys on the football field, you know, they want to win football games. They're playing hard towards the end of the season. You know, that's when it kind of gets a little bit dicey where like guys are out of the playoffs, you know, um, you know, once you start getting a lot of losses in a way, you know, it starts creeping in to like self-preservation mode from like everybody in organizations. So I don't know. It'll be interesting towards that part of the year uh, to see, you know, what's the the right thing to say or how to say it. But I think for the most part, you know, being respectful, not trying to attack people as people and more just being apparent about, you know, what it is happening that's out on the field and, you know, criticizing, I guess, that portion of it. All right. I want to ask you a question that may sound stupid to you. Okay. But okay. I am convinced, even though I've watched football forever, like I'm pretty good. I think I understand like basketball responsibilities. Football is entirely different. I would argue more than 90% of us that are talking about it regularly. Don't know what you're doing on the O-line. Don't know what the read is for the quarterback. Don't know which safety was supposed to help and who was supposed to stay. Man, you know, like I really don't think, I think it's very hard for us to know, especially with the axis of how we watch the entire thing. Okay, so I've probably read too many things about Jalen Hurts now taking over the protections because apparently you were a god when it came to this. Can 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 you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> can you tell us, like, in the most basic sense of of what you saw, and then how you adjusted the protection and what your options would be? So, like, you're coming up, you're lining up. And then what your role was and now how that, you know, like I'll get to the Jalen Hurts part of it a little bit later, but I just want to understand it better. I think the audience wants to understand it better. Yeah, I think um, that's a very complex answer. And I will try and sum it up in as most digestible and easy way in a short amount of time as I can. I think basically there's multiple different types of protections. You know, for drop back for all intents and purposes, there's five man, six man, seven man protections. But all of them kind of have, I guess what you would call like an SOP, like where the point is going to start. And that's based on whether it's a four down defense or a three, four defense. uh, And there's different parameters for those. But my job essentially is to go up, identify what the structure of the defense is and call the protection so that the offensive line, the running back, if he's involved, the tight end and the quarterback all know who we're responsible for. And typically that includes the four down defense, the four down linemen. If it's a four down, it could be, it could be a five over all five linemen are blocking all five big guys on the defense. And that'd be more like a three, four or a bear front. But your my job is to identify what defense they're in and put the protection so that everybody knows where we're at. And it's the best in line for the quarterback 
one, to pick up the people that are blitzing or, or rushing the quarterback, and then two, so the quarterback knows and has an answer uh, to deliver the football. And I think that I'm reading leverage. I'm reading spacing. Uh, a lot of people point out safeties. That is for sure a part of it. Like a safety over top of a nickel, there's a decent chance. Like, you know, I'm thinking of, okay, this is a better question. I'm thinking of where the... Um, this is awesome, by the way. Keep going. I love okay, it. I am thinking of where the eligible pass receivers are, right? Because I know that the defense has to relate to those receivers if they want to, like, actually defend them. So based on leverage of where they are in the field, whether safeties are in a position to come down and play those guys, whether linebackers are pushed over in the direction of certain players, whether D linemen are changing gaps because another guy's going to be responsible over here, I'm factoring all, all that information to try to determine if they're going to rush another person outside of the down lineman, basically blitz. And I'm kind of playing a numbers game of this is pr- based on that alignment, this is the most likely person that can come. And all of that ideally is being done with the quarterback understanding it or doing it himself, right? And if that's wrong, you have another answer someplace else. And I think that this is where Jalen doing it is really going to help. Like, I think when I did it, if it's a seven-man protection, there's a very unlikely chance that you're going to be hot because you have seven blockers. Unless it's a zero blitz, then you're always going to be hot in zero. Well, not always, but it's they're, they're, you, they should have more rushers than you can block in zero pre- blitz. But and that requires a different level of adjustments, which is like checking the play and getting to quick screens or um, you know these uh, like uh, uh, you know sprint outs and, and other things. But for six man protection, usually I'm I'm very good at setting that basic starting point and not being hot. What we saw later in the year is teams would build up what we would we call them like eight up fronts, but you put if if I if there's seven defenders in a six man protection, I feel really good at figuring that out. Once you add another element, now all of a sudden it's like, okay, I can take care of one of these sides. You need to feel really comfortable throwing off of one of these sides if that's not right. And that's what we went into the last part of the year. We faced Wink Martindale and Todd Bowles, who are great defensive coordinators and great blitzers. And they they got after us. And I think that, you know, I think at that point, whether the center's controlling it or the quarterback's controlling it, whoever's controlling it, it needs to be tied in to having an answer if that initial point is wrong. You can't just count on no matter who is and how good they are at, you know, assessing blitzers that you're going to pick it up at a high percentage. And I think that we saw it last week with Jalen. He wasn't really tested from like these extreme pressures. He had one pressure that I would consider like that's like a they end up running a saw pressure and dropping two uh, D tackles out. And I was like, that's one that you're probably going to be hot on because it's it, it messes with the count. Um, and supposedly, I, I think they might have actually been a protection to pick it up. I haven't cleared that was stout, but regardless, he felt that it was unblocked, drifted, and threw it to AJ Brown right away. And it was just a great moment of when the quarterback controls it, even when they're wrong, they're aware of it and they know and they should know where to throw the ball. And even if it's not a completion, at least the ball's out. And, you know, maybe it's third down. Worst case scenario, you're punting. But you're you're, you're reducing these severely negative plays. And now Jalen is thinking about it continually. And it should accelerate his vision across the board with all of them. And it did. I mean, even when it was just single backer blitzes, you could tell he had awareness of it. Uh, And I think at a higher level than he did probably uh, the previous few years of his career. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm trying to like, it's a very, not only does, answer. not only does it answer it, Jason though, it, cause I, I was thinking about like different things like you're breaking the huddle. There's, there's no pre set protection plan. It's like, let's see. And then adjust our protection to that and hope that I'm getting it right. And the good ones are the guys like you that were getting it right more often than not, but you're yes. not changing it so much that all of a sudden, cause like I'll see a play, right? I'll see a tackle lose to somebody on the edge. Yeah. And if I see him lose, I go, boy, it looks like he got beat. And yeah. I, I'm now reluctant to ever tweet 
you know, <laughs> hey, and I don't want to just tweet like, hey, left tackle's getting his ass kicked all day today or something like that. But the yeah. second you say something about protection, then former offensive linemen are going to line yeah. up on Twitter and tell you that you don't know. Them. And sometimes you just go, are you OK? I understand there's a lot I don't know. But yeah. are you so defensive as as a member of the O line gang that like I can't you can't just admit that I think a tackle got beat like there was it no one else on be. the side there was I, I think the guy just got beat I, there there's not like there'd be protection where you'd be pulling the guard outside or something like what are you talking well, there, about there are some uh, yeah I think I would you change the protection into somebody pulling though like that's where I start no, to wonder if, if you're yeah, making right. an adjustment like if a if a guard was pulling in like a play action protection or like a boot. That would be called, and that's going to happen regardless of what happens in the line. Of that's scrimmage. already designed, right? Yeah, that's, that's already design designed. Design. Right. Yeah, the, the the changing comes down to like where the offensive line and the center, who those guys are blocking, and then that as a result, that changes who the running back has and who the quarterback's hot off of, and that's how that happens. But I do think most of the time, most offensive linemen on Twitter who are uh, vouching for other linemen, I think that they they are probably bringing up valid points. So I would have to see these plays specifically. Um, exactly. A lot, there's right, a lot right. of like, there's a lot of ones where like, you know, there's a shift involved, right? Which is like the the man side of a five man protection is involved with blocking those two D linemen, but the tackle also has to sift the inside backer who's off the ball. And I see a lot of guys get that one wrong on like even like commentators, right? Like you'll see, you know, I don't Greg, not, but you'll see a commentator say something it's like, oh, that's not. He doesn't know that the tackle's sifting and that he's not supposed to block the end, or uh, that you know they're like, oh, the you know the I'm trying to think of like another one, like well, game. God forbid, God forbid you ever call something an RPO and it's not an RPO. I mean, Dude. that just <laughs> <laughs> you will have the like, offensive I, line I, contingency. <laughs> Mitchell Schwartz will be down your throat. He's just no, no, get no. Back. Wait, Jeff, Jeff will be Jeff off Schwartz, the top rope right before so I, I could. <laughs> I could bet somebody like 10 bucks and be like, you want to see Jeff Schwartz tweet at me in the next hour? He's going to have Watch his little this. pen. Right. He's just gonna, <laughs> but, but, you know, the funny thing is like at one point I was like, okay, I know what an RPO is. I've got yeah. it. Like makes yeah. a lot of sense. You're kind of lining it up on this side. I can see the different levels of the decisions. I've got it. And then two years later, I'm like, have I, have I been lying this whole time? I don't, because they're like, that's not an RPO. I'm like, you know, I don't even give a shit. They look the it's, same. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, I don't and, care. And that one, like, see, there's it, it changes so much. Like, even when those first started coming in, like, it, at first it was, like, all zone read, and you're reading the end. And then all of a sudden RPOs started happening. Now you're reading linebackers. And now they're, like, people call it, like, an RPR. And I'm like, what the fuck is the difference between an RPR and an RPO? <laughs> and, like, it, so it all, like – it does evolve like very quickly and sure. then, like, something that like looks very much like an RPO all of a sudden is like, no, that's just like a play action or it's just some other thing. And it's, it is hard to tell the difference for sure. So I'm with you on that. Yeah. Cause I, when they first started pop I was like, I love this play. Like this makes yeah. it. I saw Auburn doing it and I went, what yeah. a brilliant play of like how hard the decision is for the linebacker, or really yeah, anybody out in the open on that side. Like you don't even know what to do. And then it was like, no, now that's not what those things are. All right. A couple quick things before we let you sure. go. I know you've had a long day here and thanks to Kingsford and everybody <laughs> being involved. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think part of my prep today would be whether or not, you know, if you're getting the charcoal white hot enough and using a side smoker, but I'm psyched I have that research yeah, right? when we're hanging out socially. I, I'll have some nice icebreakers next time I see you. Perfect. <laughs> did, <laughs> did the tush push make you retire at the bottom of all of those files? <laughs> I, no, the tush push is like, honestly, it, feel, it looks gruesome and it is a lot of weight. But um, that was one that I was still executing at a really high level. I think I could still go out there and tush push it. It would be miserable, but I could still get that done. Uh, okay. no, what forced me into retirement was uh, knees that no longer want to block guys like Vita Vea and uh, elbows that continually pop and get stuck in certain places. So those are the things. <laughs> okay. I, I know what the rules were when they were presented to me, but I have one swift question and right. that is do you think deandre's jealous of these goal line <laughs> attempts that saquon's going to get this year we'll see I, I i am curious to see how they handle 
third and one, fourth and one with Saquon there because there's a big investment in Saquon. And sometimes that means that like, and it shouldn't impact play calling, but inevitably it does where like the Eagles want Saquon to work out even more so than like any other move they've probably made just to make sure that just to like the more touchdown Saquon has, it just looks like the best roster addition in the world. And even if he didn't have that, he gets had the same impact on the team that we could be brotherly shoving it in the end zone, but those touchdowns do factor. So I do wonder if there's going to be more touchdown opportunities in those third and one, fourth and one situations. I do think DeAndre was very frustrated last year when like he would get brought down at the one yard line. I'm like, rightfully so. I mean, he came back to the huddle one time and I'm like, brother, I am so sorry that you didn't just get in there. Like we both know what's coming. <laughs> he just did all this work to get us here. And we're going to, we're going to tush push this thing across the end zone. So I think um, it'll be interesting to see how that factors in this year, as well as like, you know, I think uh, we, it's become so apparent that we're running the tush push. I do think that there's probably an argument to be made that maybe let's get to like some of these auxiliary, right. they're hunkering everybody down in there, right? Like let's, there is literally nobody outside the tight end over here. We probably should maybe just run it over there once or twice to keep everybody honest. What a sincere answer for for a question that I was obviously just <laughs> You're like, all right, I'm taking it I'm taking it seriously. Look, yeah. um everybody everybody I know loves you, man. So I'm happy for you. I'm happy for Travis. And I, I know Andre, your guy in the New Heights deal. Yeah. And everything that's happened for you. So it's good to see the good guys uh getting it done. So thanks for today, I appreciate man. It, Ron. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Excited. We're going to talk with Ryan Day, head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes. Um, so, Coach, look, we had read about your team all summer. We know the standard. We know the talent. But there were massive expectations. We're two weeks into this. You've taken care of business. Was there a moment this summer? Was there a moment through the first two weeks where you felt like, okay, I feel like I know who my team is? Well, yeah. I, I We've had a lot of guys that, you know, are from last year's team, the last couple of years team. And these guys have been around the program a while. So, um, you know, it's not like it's a brand new squad. We did add, I think, seven guys from the transfer portal and certainly had a good recruiting class. But the nucleus of this group has been here for a while. So, um, you know, I, I think we, we know what we have. Now we're still just in the beginning stages of, of this race that we're in. And Again, just kind of coming out of the gates, and <clears throat> our guys understand that they they do, and, and we've reiterated that this week. And um, you know, we know that this is going to be a long road, and um, so this week we've spent time making sure that we're you know going back to fundamentals and making sure we're getting guys a lot of reps in practice because we're going to need a lot of guys. And you know, I think there's still some young guys that we're we're figuring that part of it out. Um, but for the the guys who are more experienced. Um, I, I think we have a good feel for that part of our team, but every year is a little different and, and some of the new pieces make it unique. I know it's not really that many more games, but you know, college football has has added some to the schedule here quite a bit in the last yeah. few years. And I know over the years of getting to know some NFL people, like they'll they'll really try to map it out. It's a, it's a difficult game. Is there more to planning for a season when you expect to be playing 15 plus games? Um, I don't know if it's more, it's, it, it's different. Um, and, and there's, it's not like markedly different. It's, but, but it is going to be, uh, a different end of the season that, you know, that, that is, that's a fact. Um, so as you, you know, start to work on your season and plan on your season, I think it, part of it depends on what your, your schedule looks like, you know, during the regular season, I think everybody's in a different, um, uh, you know, rhythm. You know, when you look at some teams, you know, look at like Clemson and Georgia, you know, they played a, you know, uh, a marquee matchup the first game of the year. The last couple of years, we played Notre Dame early in the season. Uh, this year, we didn't have that. So it's just, you know, every, every team's kind of on a different journey that way. So that part of it's different. But we're all going to end this, the season the same way with the same type of format. So, um, 
we've talked about that as as a team. We've talked about that obviously as coaches and staff and Mick Marotti, who, you know, is the best in the business at what he does and projecting out what that's supposed to look like and, you know, schematically. But most importantly, like, you know, our guys in terms of, you know, the physicality of things and the mindset as as they head in towards the end of the year. But we're a long way away from that right now. You mentioned it. Would you rather have a big test in the first three weeks? It's just different. Yeah, it's just different. Every year is different. And I don't think one's good, one's bad. It's just it's just different along the way. And, um, you know, the key is when you look at your 12-game season, you're, you're going to have these games. And where they are on your schedule is what it is. And so we have to just make sure that we're staying focused on every single week and every single opponent. And and we always do. But, you know, you got to respect every single opponent that you play. And the minute you don't, you know, you set yourself up. And and so you hear a lot of coaches talk, and we do the same thing about you know, what is our standard. We have to play to our standard. It shouldn't matter what the opponent is. And so we have to make sure we're staying on that and, and not focused, you know, necessarily on the results as it is, you know, the process. And again, a lot of coach speak there, but it's there for a reason because that's what you need to do. It's not maybe flashy or sexy. And in a world with a lot of distractions, you know, we can't we can't lose our focus. The way the portals talked about it, it's as if it's this grocery list you know for these programs now it's like okay well, let's go get this guy and and maybe from the outside we can look at it like the approach is now different in recruiting but and, you know sometimes i'll think about it and be like okay but you brought in justin fields so like what how, how is that that different right. than necessarily what you're doing now how would you i mean there has to be maybe something or an urgency how has it changed perhaps what you think is possible in the off season for a roster um I think that just the landscape's different, but when you look at our team, and I think people have made a, a big deal of our team, and but the majority of it is guys that decided to come back. It was you know, a big focus was the, the retaining of our roster, and then we certainly had a, a unique opportunity when Coach Saban, um, you know, retired at, at Alabama. There was a few guys that became available, um, and so you know we we added I think you know seven guys in the portal, and you know there's certainly you know, a lot of teams that, you know, recruit out of the portal maybe a little bit more than we do. We believe here at Ohio State, the right formula for us is to recruit at a high level, develop, and then retain that team that's here. And one thing that we've learned during the last year or so, you know, in this, you know, NIL age is that there's a lot of opportunities for Ohio State football players. Um, the, the marketability of our players is significant. And, and that's, that's all being kind of played out in real time and allowing us kind of a benchmark as we move forward. Because, you know, when you have a, a fan base of over 12 million and what comes with the Ohio State brand, you know, it's significant to be an Ohio State football player. And so the opportunities are there. And that's, that's clear to see. And I think as, as the market's being set, I think Ohio State's leading the way. I want to talk about Chip because I think the relationship is just so unique. I've known him for years, you know, going back to, I remember just getting the globe when I was living in Boston. I'd be like, what are they doing up at UNH? It's like, who's this Ricky Santos guy? Like, what, what is going on up there? And these numbers every weekend, you'd read them. Uh, you played for him. You, know, you end up joining him in a couple stops in the NFL. He's out here in Los Angeles, and then he comes back. How much of an advantage is your relationship when you're looking at the game, like philosophically of like who you want to be on that side of the football, what kind of advantage does that relationship give you? I think there's two things. One is the trust. I think that's very, very important when you're dealing in a, you know, pressure packed environment, you know, trust is critically important because, you know, you're going to go through, um, you know, a lot of pressure packed moments, you know, in game, you know, post game, and when there's a certain level of trust there, you can have real conversation. Uh, you can have you can have conflict, but you know you leave the room, arms around each other, knowing that you love each other and you're saying the same message, and that everybody's on board and there's alignment there and loyalty. And uh, to me, that's like the number one thing when it comes to the schematics of it. I mean, I played for Chip, you know, and then I coached for him, so we see things very, very similar. Now, you know, since you know, the, the seven years that we were apart, 
uh, you know, we kind of went down a different road than, than he did at UCLA. And it's been great because a lot of guys in that offensive staff room, um, you know, see things the same way, including myself. Um, it's very much in line with the way that Chip sees it, but he also sees it from a different perspective as well in certain areas. So that perspective has been refreshing, I think, for everybody in that room um, to see things maybe a little bit different, challenge certain things. Um, and so I think the chemistry in that room is good. But so I think two things. One, there's a commonality there, but there's also a fresh perspective. And then two, the overall trust, uh, you know, between he and I, I think really, um, you know, so far has has allowed us to, you know, address some real issues in, 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 you know, in that room in terms of like real hard questions that need to be, you know, need to be answered. Uh, and there's going to be bigger challenges ahead, as we know. What was the first conversation like between you? Because I look, I know he loves you. He's talked about you to me for, for years. And it's not only playing and co- you coaching with him, him coaching you and all this stuff. But like the first time maybe where you were thinking, hey, could we do this? Could this happen? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not going to get into the details of everything that came up during the conversation, but, um, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I, I know we always wanted to coach again together. And, you know, I, I kind of threw it out there. And um, I think there was a certain, um, you know, time frame where, you know, kind of pro- had to process it all. Um, and, and, you know, the timing wasn't right really the first time around. And, uh, you know, he had a lot going on there at UCLA and wanted to make sure, you know, if he were to go uh, down this road that he wanted to handle it the right way, which I thought he did an unbelievable job of doing. But, um, you know, the conversations that we had was that he really enjoyed being in that room and coaching the quarterbacks during the bowl game. And he, he missed that part of it. He missed just the, the football end of it. And, you know, he's going to be, you know, very much involved in recruiting and, and so many other things. But like I, I can... I can focus on, you know, all these other things now that come with being the head football coach where, you know, he can focus more on the football, which um, is refreshing to him. And and so he's obviously been excited about that part of it. It really feels like the head coaching position, especially at a program like Ohio State, you know, it's a a short list of programs in the country where the standards are are what they are. There have to be times where you're like, this isn't even about football anymore. I'm being pulled in all of these different directions. How do you deal with like getting your dream job and then realizing that the job maybe isn't exactly what you thought about or what you thought it would be when you were younger and you were an assistant? Yeah. And and sometimes the reasons and the characteristics that, you know, you display in order to have an opportunity like this and, um, and get a job like this isn't necessarily what you need in order to do the job, which is unique. Um, you know, I always kind of felt like I was, you know, someone who wanted to be a head coach and really spent a lot of time with, you know, the head coaches that I was fortunate enough to be around, some great mentors. Because this this profession is really about apprenticeship. You don't go to school to be a football coach. You know, where do you learn about the schematics of football? Where do you learn about, you know, all the things that come with you know, the public relations part, the recruiting, you know, the staff management. I mean, there's just so many different things that come with, quote unquote, being a CEO. And, um, you know, I went to school at the University of Hampshire for business management, got my master's in administrative studies at Boston College. And there's a lot of things that you learn during that process that helps you become a better football coach. But there's a lot that you just, you have to learn through apprenticeship. And that um, was something that I was very fortunate to be around great coaches and tried to take something from each of those guys. And then, and then when you have this opportunity, uh, you know, the landscape changes quickly and you have to be willing to adapt. And that's one of the things that I've come to grips with is that every year it's going to be different. I mean, the first year was, was its own set of challenges and then COVID came and now the different changes in the landscape and being able to adapt and being comfortable with um, not knowing what's coming next is something that you have to, um, you know, grab onto. And I think leadership is important during uncertain times. And we've had those moments even, you know, in the, in the time that I've been the head coach here. So, but you also learn a lot. You, you learn a lot about yourself every time, you know, you go through a season, you learn more and more. You know, I'm now 45 years old and I feel like I'm in a different place than I was when I started here. And you learn every year and you grow from it. Um, and so, you know, that's, 
that's the job right now. And, and, um, you know, in order to move up in this profession, you have to give up, you know, and, and I think I've certainly embraced that this year and, and making sure that, you know, I'm able to step away a little bit more from the offense and, and get, get more involved in these other things that you're talking about. So you mentioned your background and, and I'll just share with you. I think the only non-sports job I've ever had once I graduated was I was an insurance consultant. I wasn't even an insurance salesman, which is really hard to do to be a consultant in an industry that you've never actually worked in. So that didn't quite work out, but it was a, it was a few months and I knew immediately, I was like, I don't want to do this, right. but it made my dad feel better about his son. He's like, you did go to school. Was there ever a moment in your timeline where you, know, you think about the sacrifice you know, what kind of lifestyle that you're taking on, finding a way to navigate through all these coaching circles and, and knowing that, hey, if this doesn't really work out, like maybe I end up being an assistant for the rest of my life in the middle of nowhere and all these. Did you ever have a moment where you were going to go non-football? Yeah. Yeah. You, you During the process, you know, our, our family, you know, Nina and I grew up in the same hometown. Um, you know, her dad was a, was a basketball coach and uh, in town and he kind of stayed there, you know, during his career, had opportunities to go places, but kind of built a community there in, in, in our hometown. And then, you know, we decided to, to take a chance and, and after, you know, it was really Boston college, you know, I was, I was back and forth between Boston college and Philly, you know, at temple with the Eagles and, you know, had to make decisions on, you know, moving away from family and, and chasing, um, you know, a dream of, of becoming a head football coach. And, and that's a family decision. And, you know, we had to move 11 times. And the sacrifice that's made is, is, is more for the family than it is for the coach and embracing everything that comes with that. And I think along the way, everybody in the family has to understand, you know, the goal and the goal is to make an impact on young people. And that's why we're in this profession. And, uh, and then also embracing the family into recruiting, into, you know, being in the building and being around the players and enjoying game day and, and all those things. And, and so, uh, and that's allowed, you know, me the opportunity to continue to work through those moments of doubt that you have along the way, like, okay, you know, I'm on the road recruiting, you know, for a whole month, um, you know, after the season and, you know, I haven't seen my family and, you know, all coaches kind of go through that same thing of like, all right, is this really worth it? But, um, but when the family can support you and be involved, it certainly makes it a lot easier. And then as you work your way, uh, during the career, what you realize is that it eventually comes down to the impact you're making on people's lives. And, and that's where the focus has to be. Um, and so my family has allowed me that opportunity because of the support they've given me. You're also smart to have a wife whose father is a coach, right? So <laughs> it certainly she, kind, she kind of knew the deal and maybe you had an ally there. On the other doesn't side. make it easier. I can promise you that they just no, know I mean, exactly what to expect. Uh, how does being someone that has experience in the NFL help you as a college head coach? A couple things. I think the first thing is that it allows you the opportunity to um, handle high end athletes and, and, and how you um, help them get better and, and being professional. That when you show up, like you got to be on point because they expect you to be the best in a world at what you do. And if they believe that you're getting them better, then you'll have their attention. If you don't, you can lose them. So I think um, also how do you challenge them without making it, you know, uh, adversarial? You know, you, you have to treat them like men, but you also have to challenge them and, and, and create conflict because that's the only way you get better. So I think how you handle the high-end athlete is it was one thing that I really felt like I learned from being in the NFL. I think the second thing is just, schematically as time goes on the length of an NFL season how do you get an identity uh, grab onto it but then also keep things fresh so you give your guys the best opportunity to be successful and not get into a rut of either running too many things on offense defense or special teams where you don't have an identity or two running the same things over and over again where you know guys can you know really narrow in on you and identify what you're trying to do and finding that balance during a long season when I think about the background, you know, we, we've touched on the UNH part of this, but it was ahead of its time. And then chips at Oregon, it felt like, hey, what are they doing out there? Right. And then yeah. I, I think about like how this is what I love about college football. It's why some of the conference realignment stuff, I've already done this rant far too many times. So I'm not going to share it with you. But I, I loved Saturdays because I felt like 
the football represented geographically like the beliefs of how football should be played and and with realignment i think we'd lose some of that but if you'd grown up in iowa you know maybe you would be married to a style of football that's different than what you would learned in new hampshire you know what i mean like all of these different places that that have these different styles i mean how much do you think you are and i, I think about this a lot with styles of football and, and 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 how things have kind of caught up but like when you're designing philosophically the foundation everything that you've learned you go okay this is the way football should be played do you think it's because you're right or do you think it's because that's your background and that's what you're most comfortable with no i think it's a it's, it's a pretty deep discussion um and, and i i think about it a lot you know i think about ohio state and to your point like a lot of people and a lot of great coaches have a lot of great ideas jim Knowles has run a lot of different styles of defenses. Chip Kelly's run a lot of different styles of offense. You saw him wide open with Oregon with, you know, four wides. And you saw him at UCLA, you know, in 22 personnel or three tight ends in the game. And so, you know, and, and even before we went to the no huddle back in college, like that was a bigger, heavier set with fullbacks and running the ball, option football. So the idea is finding the right things that fit your players. And one of them is the skill set that you have on the team. But another thing is based on the opponents that you play and what's coming down the road. And when I think about Ohio State, you know, we're playing in the Big Ten. So there's a certain level of physicality, toughness, run the football uh, that has to run throughout the entire building. You know, if you don't win the rushing yards in the Big Ten, you know, you're not going to win the championship. You have to run the football and stop the run and play physical football. But, you know, as you look at Ohio State, the expectations are to beat the rival, win the Big Ten, chin, Big Ten championship, win the national championship. Once once you get out of the Big Ten, you know, and you find yourself in a playoff game or in a bowl game, and you're you know in an indoor environment, you know, now you may find yourself opening the game up a little bit and having, you know, a game where you need to be able to go play in space, um, and you know it turns into a little bit more of a track meet. So what we try to do when we recruit. And also when we build our identity on in all three phases is, you know, be able to get into a fist fight, you know, in, you know, driving rain at 40 mile an hour winds in November, you know, in Chicago, but also, you know, being able to play, you know, in a dome, uh, you know, with a really, you know, athletic team from somewhere else in a different part of the country, if that makes sense. It does. And when I, when I watch a receiver group, which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's absurd, but it, it feels like. And when I look at a basketball team, I'll go, okay, they have three great players, but they overlap. It's a bit redundant. Yeah. So I may not like this team as much as another team that may not on paper have the same amount of talent because I feel like the other group complements each other. And when I look at your receiver group and then the Howard dynamic, where if you want to just let him run through guys, you have that you, that you can go to. Um, how much does that? How much does that balance? kind of help you feel like you can get to everything you want to get to on Saturdays? Well, that was the plan and putting it all together. There's no question about that. Now, you know, what it looks like and how we continue to build and the journey and what we do in these games is uh, to be seen. But, you know, everything that you're mentioning was was thought thought out very carefully. And a, a big job, a big part of our job and, and my job is talent acquisition, and making sure that we have these right guys in the right spots and um, it worked hard to make sure that we, you know, we hand select these guys and do a good job. And, um, listen, we don't get everybody that we want, but the ones that we do, we do everything we can to, to make sure they understand what it means to be a Buckeye and what, what we can do, you know, in terms of, of them after football and the development that's here and all those types of things. And so, um, you know, we try to go out and go, go exact, do exactly what you said. And when you look at, you know, defensively kind of where we're at right now, when you look at where we're at offensively. You know, there, there's there's a plan for that and making sure that, you know, we do have all this versatility down the road. But, you know, that's that's why we've got to just continue to get to work and make sure that we're able to put it on the field. OK, last thing. And I've interviewed enough coaches over the years to, to think, OK, I might be able to guess the answer. OK, but I'm, I'm still going to try. Sure. And it has to do with criticism. OK, it has to do with criticism at the highest levels and as I mentioned before, Ohio State standard is up there with any other program, right? It's expected to win the conference. It's expected to compete for national championships every single year, and you better get a couple, right? And, you know, I do think one of the cool things that you mentioned about guys coming back 
is a credit to the program. But I also think, and maybe I'm too old and I'm, I'm hanging on to some tradition, but I think the fact that you have this class of guys that had never beaten Michigan, that it was really, really important for them to get a win against Michigan at some point and be able to come back to Columbus and not be the group that was like, we actually never beat those guys. And I, I think that's awesome that that matters to a group of young kids, maybe five or six guys that could have gone on the first two rounds of the NFL draft. So there's a difference between being in the national media, as I've been for years, going back to my early local days where one of the advantages of being nationals, I feel like I can see all of it and then kind of compare all the different things where locally you're so close to it, even though you know it better, I think you can become irrational. And so at the end of last season, I was hearing criticism about you. And again, we don't have any relationship whatsoever, but to me, it was just common sense of like, he's 58 and eight, 58 and eight now with the, (laughs) he's, he's, he's 39 and three in the conference. He won the big 10 the first two years he's there. I understand the rivalry part of it, but like you're mad at this guy. (laughs) This is the guy you're upset with, uh, which blows my mind. So I did this long segment on the whole thing where I'm like, be careful what you wish for here. Now, the whole reason I set that up is that I know if I ask you, like, does it ever bother you? You're just going to tell me this is what you've signed up for. But are there ever moments where maybe it doesn't impact you, but impacts someone close to you where you feel like, do people realize how good of a job we're actually doing here despite the disappointing regular season end? Well, I, I think, you know, after last season and the season before, I mean, there's frustration. You know, there's frustration from us more than anybody. You know, the players, the coaches, the ones that are, you know, here in the Woody that are closest to it. And, you know, there's people who love Ohio State football. I mean, and when you have 12 million fans, you know, 5% is, is still a lot of people. And so when you deal with that, you, you know, you're going to deal with all that comes with that. But, you know, when when you're frustrated, sure, and we, we all want to kind of lash out. And we all want to be great. We all want to beat our rival. We all want to win championships. So to see our guys, you know, kind of regroup after that and come back together and, and keep working towards this is important. I think, you know, when you, uh, you know, have an opportunity to have a group of guys like this come together, you know, you, you just have to focus on day to day. You can't get out in front of it because you want it so bad. And, and there's nobody who wants it more than the guys in, in you know, in this building. And so, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot that comes with, you know, coaching at the highest level of college football. And, you know, when you have a young family and everything like that, yeah, of course. I mean, that's just real. I mean, you know, uh, you know, we're all human and, you know, and, and we all want to do great. And I think probably the thing for my family and I is, you know, when we don't win, we win a lot of games around here, but when we don't win and certainly, you know, when we lost that game, uh, you just feel like you've let so many people down. And, and I think that's, you know, where it takes time to recover from. Then you come back together and, and you, you, you know, you, you make sure that you, you come back stronger and you learn from why that didn't happen. And then you do everything you possibly can to get yourself back in that situation again and go uh, and go win those those games. And so, you know, that's what we've done. And you know, the way that you have to look at it is it's an opportunity, you know, and I mentioned this to the staff. I said, you know, no matter what you do in the past, you learn from it. Right. And, and you can prepare for the future, but you got to maximize right now on how many times in life you're going to have an opportunity to do something special like this. And, and so that's why we have to maximize every day. I think we're 89 days away from the rivalry game and, you know, uh, that's a hundred and some odd days away from some of these championships. And so every day has to be maximized. And if you start to look at anything else, you can get yourself out of whack and distracted. And so we're not going to do that. So, um, you know, that, that gives you a little bit of insight on kind of, you know, where we've, where we've been and, and kind of where we're going in our mindset now. Yeah. I mean, I, you can't look ahead, but I, I already am looking ahead, so I, I can't wait. And I do think it's a, uh, it's a, it's a credit to everything you're doing to, you know, we can talk about, Hey, there's more incentive for students to stay, which I think is great. But I also think in, in today's day and age, when that NFL carrot's dangling in front of you to come back to Columbus, because you feel like there's unfinished business. Um, I don't know how often that's going to happen. A lot of programs. Well, I also so, think I also think when 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 all that you know gets said, you know, you talk about you know, the culture of this program and that there is strong stability here in retaining our roster on a yearly basis, and that we don't have to go into the portal to go you know change twenty to thirty percent of our roster, you know, 
uh, it's it's about five to ten percent every year, and that matters because you know we're not allowed to have a bad year at Ohio State. That's just that's just not possible. So we have to continually build this through great people, and that's through recruiting, talent acquisition, coaching staff, staff members in the building to make sure that that stability is there for an extended period of time as well. And that's another thing that you know we make sure that we're we're all over on a daily basis. Yeah, well, it's a great start so far, and uh, this is this is huge for us for you to be able to take the time in a busy schedule. So thanks again. Oh, absolutely, much respect, man. The Alliance. Uh, let's try to figure this one out. Last week, Saruti, how did we do? I know we two didn't win. No, yeah, two and two. Uh, you and Kyle, actually, same game. Both had the Tennessee game. Both won. I think it was the the points and the under. And Wargon and I lost. So, Ryan, you're two and zero, oh, and the rest of us are one and one on our bets. Right, but and- to, to be fair, when we're keeping track of this, I'm not going to brag about an alt spread record, even though both games would have won on the original number anyway. But that's yep. like last year. I don't think I did. I don't even know if I did any alt spreads last we didn't. year. We didn't, but we only did three right. legs last year. So it was right. a little bit different. Yeah. So we're trying to stay in the plus 400 range. So there plus could be times where... Yeah. Four yeah. legs plus so, 450. So the alt thing will still be in play as we try to scrape through this. Okay, so um, why don't you guys uh, start the board? All right. Well, you know, it's football. It means you can do your job completely and someone else could screw it up. And uh, that's okay. We got a short memory. <laughs> oh, um, that's so, seems- <laughs> Short memory, short memory. Moving on to Cincinnati. And so uh, sticking with vibes, uh, great Sopranos doc. I'm not sure if this was in the doc or if this was something in my feed, but you got your your hunchback of Notre Dame. You got your quarterback of Notre Dame. You got your halfback of Notre Dame. Quasimodo predicted all this. Isn't that strange? You ever thought about that? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the alt spread for Notre Dame at Purdue, and it's going to be minus six and a half. And that's going to get minus one seventy. I think that's that's pretty good. I think the the original number is minus nine and a half. This just seems a little safer, so we'll we'll do that. I don't know that I love Kyle talking that level of trash a week removed from being the only one wrong. But I mean, we're really just keeping track of the standings, so we know. Short what memory, dude. Up I mean, just... And you know, fair. That's what happened week one. So that's all I'll say on that. I'm gonna I'll, let me go next because if you're gonna take the Notre Dame minus six and a half alt alt uh, spread. I'm actually going to take the all under in that one, 51 and a half. Um, I feel like Riley Leonard, are, are people that afraid of him throwing the ball at this point? I think they'll bounce back. But Purdue's also a good run team, good against the run. I think it's going to be kind of a grind. So I, I just give me the under. Okay, so same game. So you guys are doing the Tennessee NC State thing that we did last week. Okay, well, Oregon? No, I'm not. I'm not. Like, yeah, I'm no. not. There was a chuckle there from Oregon as if I was yeah. against it. it. It worked. I just think calling it the Tennessee NC State thing is kind of funny. <laughs> Well, because we did the exact same thing <laughs> last week. Yeah, that's fair. Maybe we did yeah, uh, more same-game stuff anyway. Okay. We're right, gonna, I'm, look, got, I'm looking at a total Utah. on a tight end from the Boilers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Utah Utah State. Uh, both both schools probably playing backup quarterbacks this week, so I'm just looking under the point total. It's uh, 43 and a 43.5. I'm going to alt that up to 47.5, so under 47.5 minus 192. Yeah, and Ohio State, I think it was the first shutout for USC in like a decade. Uh, they they hammered them, so I like it. Okay, uh, I'm going with the post emotional win on the road for Texas at Michigan, and if we have the number right now in front of me against UTSA, it's minus thirty five and a half. UTSA is actually one and one, but um, I mean they lost to Texas State forty nine ten. My my hope for this game would be that Texas just comes out a little slow you know it's not the earliest window of the kickoff but what can i get this up to we're going 40 and a half on the alt spread so bumping it up another five points yeah 40 and a half all right so utsa plus 40 and a half at texas and those four get us to plus 461 boys so you know we're just we're trying to get in that sweet spot in that range and by the way there are i believe we got a 50 percent profit boost token for parlays including the college football parlays including the alliance and a 50 percent profit boost on the wisconsin uh, alabama game so you can actually get those odds a little higher if you like some of our bets here's, here's the thing too it's like if you like one of them and you don't like other them you could it's like a little bit of a buffet, a buffet situation pick what you like but pick what you don't like and make your own parlays but this is ours so there you go okay we're looking to go one and two three weeks in <laughs>
excited about it. Okay, and to continue the, we're going to call it a uh, couch research money. Three picks, my couch instinct. Looking at the public money, public bets, uh, which are two different things. So we're going to go with public bets, and then um, a tip from the people that are supposed to know this stuff better than I am. All right. So last week it was one and two where fading the public was the only one that worked. Uh, my pick lost the sharp pick lost. So the sharp pick right now, we're going to go with this one. There's a few that throw my way, but the Denver Pittsburgh line Steelers at Broncos, that lines moved from Steelers minus two, Minus three and a half to now minus two and a half. The sharp play is apparently Denver plus two and a half. All right. Um, the percentage of public bets, there's two at 85% as of this taping on the Action Network. Um, and believe it or not, the Broncos are very public side on the bets. So we'll stay away from that one and not use it again. Um, 85% of the bets are on the Bucks plus seven and a half at Detroit. So let's fade that and go Detroit minus seven and a half. And do I dare do it again? What line makes no sense? Because this is, won't be based on research. <laughs> All right. Um, the Panthers line <laughs> opened. They were three and a half point dogs at home against the LA Chargers. Um, let me see. Let me try to get it on FanDuel here. So if I go and look at the NFL odds as of this taping, because that line was just like, come on. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's different in a couple different places. So I can't believe I'm going to do this. But yeah, I am going to do it. Uh, give me Carolina plus four and a half at home against the Chargers. So one and two start. See how it goes this week. The email address, life advice, rr at gmail.com. What is good, Kyle? Also, what is good, Steve? Yo. Life is good. How's everybody? Brian. Life is good. We're good. Life We're officially good sold out in Philly, by the way, boys. Oh, damn it. I knew it. Well, I knew this was going to be a problem. <laughs> if that guy has any tickets, let me know. I knew this was going to be a problem. You already don't, you're already jammed up with the, the traveling Wilburys, Kyle Berries. <laughs> yeah, well, again, like, it's, what are, it's just, it's, it's unclear the number that's going to, I know at least a couple a, guys are taking flights. Give us a range. What's the number? I mean, I'd say uh, a conservative number, number would be like five and a... Yeah, uh, but it's not five. I can tell you're just... I'd say you're it not could be closer to like eight or nine, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, but That's how assuming many... my parents don't go, which could make it an even 10, so I don't know. We want your family. We want... But how many... Well, see, the thing about it is my family, every once ruffians, in a while, they'll jacks. ask me, they'll be like, my, my family, the closest people to me, be like, so what exactly do you do again? It's only been like seven years, so... Uh, I don't know if they want to take the hard right turn into here. I am Whoa. on stage and uh, left turn. I don't know what's the right answer, but <laughs> I, I just don't know if they like the being from like, what do you do to like, is that guy drinking whiskey up there? I, I, don't, I don't know. So we'll, we'll see. Maybe I won't have whiskey. Gotta have one whiskey. Do Curry. you have any plus anything, Surdy, for a Philly show? I don't think so. Um, other than just like ringer people, like I'd like shield to come. Uh, Debundo, producer Cliff, a few, few different people. Um, but no, I don't think I have any like friends and family. I don't have anybody in Philly. I don't have a ton of people in Philly. I think I'm also a plus zero. So, <laughs> nice. That's great news then. Okay, great. Because <laughs> we had an issue with Denver trying to get the guys in. And, and you know, Allison or uh, Elizabeth was like, yeah, I don't know. Ryan's got quite a crew. I'll let you know if there's anything left over. So that's good news then. I think we'll be okay. Yeah, Denver, I had like a plus 20. Yeah. Um, huge in denver that's fair yeah no i've got a wedding actually i'm flying from cleveland for a wedding to philly to the show so i'm just doing like Shoot. a nice you know swing state visit America's tour for four, four things happen yeah. am i right yeah never been so check it out well i think chris long is going to need a couple plus whatever yeah that's that's oh, fair think about that that guy's awesome he's probably got a lot of friends all right yeah yeah Kyle. should have asked if kelsey we should ask kelsey to come it was a miss 
I could always text him. Nope. I think we, we got enough. I think we got enough. <laughs> <laughs> what if Kelsey, what if all the Kelsey's want to come? What if Travis Including, loves Chris Long? You need like secret yeah. service there, right? Yeah. Taylor Travis here. She's fun. like, wait, we're still a live show in Philly. Cancel the tour. Imagine, imagine she's like, I know this guy plays football, but this guy's going to ruin the world tour. I think only 5% of people are getting these zingers. They're pretty good. Yeah. You ever heard of travel lock before? Yeah. Wait, you're the Iceland guy? <laughs> there are some sneaky fans of a the travel log. He's just, a like, leader in the think. space. Yeah. 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 I mean, how the travel log, anyone listens to it without pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so Rudy and I, when we first discussed it, He's like, I don't know, dude. And I was like, I also don't know. Yeah. And Saruti, Saruti has my back as much as any person walking the planet. But it was a, it was a good conversation. I go, look, if it if it completely bombs, it bombs. Saruti's like, I don't know. I think people like travel stuff because they can see things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, visual medium. <laughs> but hey. Also, uh, but, not wrong. Not wrong, by the but way. If, if the, I was also out on the baseball draft and the baseball draft thing seemed to play. You know, so yeah, I was out on it while I was doing it. I was so out on it, I didn't even do it this year. That played like in the way people watch like those movies, like The Room, right? Like Troll Two. They're just like, all right, should should we just like uh, bear witness to this ridiculousness? So you just grit your teeth and get through it. (laughs) (laughs) Like it says, there's still an hour left. What could there be? (laughs) Yeah, the prep for that was tough though, because I was like, how are you going to fill all this dead time when it's not your pick? So. Um, anyway, all right, let's get to a couple of emails here. We got one, um, this is more of a feedback thing, but I felt like it was timely five, nine average build never lifted. Curious if the Brady deflection was ordered from the top down or is the decision to provide security for Brady's feelings made in team. Ooh, um, a little spice on that one. Mm. Not wrong though. That's exactly what happened. Um, you know, Brady's debut was was harshly criticized, and Bill was having a really tough day. <laughs> and Bill called me and said, "Hey, bro." He's like, "What are you going to do about Brady?" And I was like, <laughs> "I don't know. Guy can't catch a fucking break." And he was like, "You know how much I love Tom." And I know how much you love Tom. And I was like, I love Tom. I have the Jeff Potts connection, NBD, the legend, Will McDonough. Back in the day when Saint was rolling, went back late night. The female women that were with us thought that it was Tom Brady's house that they were going to. Boy, were they disappointed. Bummer for them, yeah. <laughs> when it was not Tom Brady's house. I think there was a guy who played in the revolution. I asked him how much money he made at the after hours. And he was like, are you seriously asking me how much money I make? Like, I'm just curious about what salaries are for guys in the league. And he's like, how much money do you make? I go $38,000 a year. I'm in local radio. <laughs> and he was like, now I don't feel so bad. And then he told me what he made. And I gained knowledge. The make it less guys happy to tell you. The, the make it more guys usually like you first. <laughs> And when you're making no money, you're like, you're going to be impressed how low this is. And I can't wait to tell you. (laughs) Yeah, I thought I thought it was like the other way around thing where he thought I was big being comfortable. Like, I totally understand people deciding, like, why are you asking me how much money? I don't I don't normally do it. But it was also a sort of later setting the whole deal. The point is, there's some Brady connections. So, yeah, I was defensive of him. Strictly because of those relationships and a mandate from Bill. So, yeah, you got us first. (laughs) Just want to get in front of it. Thanks for staying on top of that. Yeah. Before awful announcing finds it. Mm. So, okay. Uh, Here's one very Kyle related. How do I become Kyle? 26, 5'11, 160. No impressive gym stats, but I'm up from 142 at the start of the year. Whoa, dude. Packing on way to go. You got a long way to go. (laughs) <laughs> just ran it. Trying to be me. Well, uh, are you are you bigger than the wedding weight? Less? Where are I we don't at? Know. I'm not sure. I you're not aware. I'm not aware. I used to be aware. I'm not aware now. But every once in a while, 
you know, I, I maybe I'm a yo-yo in a bit where I, like sometimes I can look a little, but I don't know what the actual, you know, tough shirt, the center, tough shirt. You know about that? <laughs> hey, I don't bro. know if the center of gravity Who changes around, about? you know, from time to time. But it's like somebody be like, "Hey, you're looking great," and then uh, you know, frolic. Some people are like, "Hey, I thought you were losing weight, buddy. What's going on?" Give a little yeah. pat on the belly, and I'm like, "Ah, oh, all right." Uh, yeah, Don't I don't know. Do I haven't checked, so I don't know. Okay. Um, Are you a weight guy, Ryan? Yeah. Oh, twice come on. Gas in You're on the numbers, I, this guy? Come on. I'm just kind of fascinated. Like, I just, we have a scale. It took a while this to get one in the house. walking abacus. Twice yeah. Well, some people, you know, some people don't care about it. numbers on hand. But I, the scale, the way, I weigh myself, kilograms. like, every night. I'm just, like, fascinated. I just like to see, like, the, what the fluctuation is. Uh, big meal, you know? Just, just interesting. What's the most you've ever weighed? 168, I think. What was going on that? I don't even know what that looks like on you. What was going on at 168? Was, was, that, was that when you had the most hair? What was no, no, no. This was recently. I'm, I'm, I, I can stand to lose a few LBs, but I, I'm, you know, I'm anywhere now between 162 and 168. Kind of goes. I think now, that was probably, that was like post bachelor party. Maybe I think I came back. It was I was just swollen. wasn't feeling great. <laughs> Kyle. What's what? your what's your top number? Oh boy, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is you like asking know. somebody what, how, how much they make. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what's worse? <laughs> this probably. This okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right, back to the email. Uh, this guy's trying to get to one seventy five by the end of the year, dude. You were at one forty two. What, what are you? That doesn't sound like peanut butter way. Uh, basketball <laughs> comp: T.J. McConnell without any defensive ability. White guy who plays hard and everyone thinks can shoot, but really can't. Ooh, okay. What's got for? I currently run a podcast studio. We'll leave the location out. Just we try to clean these up for you. Owned by a fairly prominent name in the area. Um, basically, my job is to produce and edit for all the podcasts that rent out our space. 25 current clients. I'm not 100% sure what Kyle does for The Ringer, but I would imagine it's fairly similar. It might be completely off, though. I also host two different podcasts myself right now, one for sports discussions and one for basic interviews. I've been running my own different podcast for about a decade now as side projects. I left my cushy sales job in March of last year to start my own media company. Whoa. All right. That eventually he's, he's not stressed out. He's not like stress losing weight. He's packing on I don't know how he's packing on all the muscle on top of everything else that eventually failed. And I found this new opportunity to continue in the career I want to be in instead of going back to the sales world. My question is fairly simple. What else do I need to do to learn to be ready for a role similar to Kyle and Saruti in the future? Once again, not exactly sure what Saruti's role is. <laughs> hey, neither, my family doesn't know what my role is. I just catch trays left and right on this podcast <laughs> no. now. Uh, you are a stray catcher, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think this is actually a stray. I think this is him just admitting openly no, I know. he's not. Yeah, yeah. Because when I when I saw it, I went, "Oh no!" And let's let's be fair to everybody here. I, I don't think that was the intent. Just looping him into the conversation so everybody feels included. I know what it takes to produce, edit, post, and even host a successful podcast. But I'm always trying to improve my skills. Hopefully, get a better job at a larger company on the content side. When the time comes, my ultimate goal would be to produce or editor while also partially on the content side of things for bigger, well known, and established media company. Um, doesn't sound so like he you want to be me, time. man. It sounds like you want to be Tate Frazier. Maybe you should talk to him. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm How not do we a... become Kyle? What happens? I mean, um, everybody's just going to say it's because of Bill and you're late. Yeah, you should have it. You not... should have it. Uh, an aunt that really has always liked you, and then marries a guy who becomes awesome. Uh, and then uh, you get in trouble in college. They start to think about you for the first time in a while. They get concerned, and then. Uh, she Jedi mind tricks him into helping me out. And then uh, your car breaks down and, and you can't be a PA to get coffee. And you ask the dudes in the audio room if they need help. Yeah, I really don't know uh, what. Yeah, but you're it more than like that. You know now. all the things. Yeah, I know. But I'm saying it sounds like you know all the things. And the only reason uh, I'd say I could probably do the job fast. And uh, we've cleaned up the mistakes over the last, you know, five so years. It's like I'm not I'm not missing edits or anything because sometimes it could be a little stressful when they're like, where's the pod? The game just ended, whatever. Uh, but yeah, it sounds like you've got all the stuff. I mean, it doesn't sound like you're doing anything different than what I, you've, you like even went out, started a media company, failed and found a new job. Like I haven't done any of those things. So I don't know. Maybe I should ask you, maybe I should pick your brain. As a producer, I would say don't, but try not to talk when you're not spoken to unless somebody asks <laughs> for that. That's the one thing I would say. There were some, some people, some people uh, that I, you know, 
I'm aware of over my many years here that were like turning on the mic and then there were conversations after like what's what the fuck is that about what is this what's going on if he does it one more time we're gonna have a problem on air so i would just say you know try to read the room and see if anybody wants that from you and if not that happens anywhere though i remember we were at east being radio dating back to then to be like new board op it's like all right my turn to crack the mic it's like who, who is this guy <laughs> what's going on wait right there now? was somebody that jumped in <laughs> it happens was all the with time us? i feel like no but well maybe it didn't happen but, with us very often i don't the, remember a new guy just going hey van pelt uh <laughs> real quick wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah last segment you said this mm. um <laughs> actually i wish that had happened now that i think about it that would have been but it wouldn't have gone over very very well uh at the time so here's I know, Saruti, you, you have a lot on this because your story is very different. You didn't have any desire to be on the air. You were totally cool being behind the scenes. And then you kind of ended up on the air and you do the soccer pod stuff with us, which is great. But you're still not like navigating the off mic stuff for this day, this final destination of like, OK, the Saruti show exists. Like, I know we've talked about this. You you actually maybe could go that route if you wanted to. And then you had the on-air thing with the NBA channel, That's which is right. still, right. Which is still kind of, <laughs> yeah, right. Which is still kind of crazy. Because I know you, like, I've met a ton of people that get into production that want nothing to do with production and they want to be on the air. And um, it sounds like our emailer probably likes that part of it because look being on the air is more fun than not being on the air but for some people it's just i don't want that i don't want to have to come up with shit every single day you know especially when you're back in the radio days like every day you've got yeah. a thought are you, you serious on the air the way i'm on the air that's the best <laughs> that's the best <laughs> yeah right like my just grandma a, asked me the other day she's a little like, dip of frosting <laughs> yes that's like my grandma asked me the other day when i went over to have dinner with her just every once in a while it's not because she's old she really has never known she's like so what do you do again and i told her and I'm like what's the what's the life help thing and i was like oh it's it's silly life, life advice, whatever. she's like so you don't know what you're gonna say i'm like no <laughs> and that's the way i want it so that's the, that's the move <laughs> that would be awesome though in five years Kyle's like enough of this shit i'm the star life help with life. kyle <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great <laughs> People are bad. People would tune in. People like well, Kyle, man. Well, it's um, funny because when when I told when I confirmed that it's life advice, she just was like, "Why would you ever do that? What qualifies ouch. you?" Yeah, ouch. I was like, "No, I think that's <laughs> exactly. Part of the joke. I think that's the joke." And she's like, "No, nah, I don't get it. I don't like it." I'm like, all right, well, yeah. Right. Thanks for yeah. Lost, yeah. A, lost a listener. Yeah. I don't think my parents have any idea what I do uh, since I left ESPN. They probably didn't even know what I did there either. But they they don't. They don't get it. My my mom is like, and, and the thing is, my mom's like on social media all the time. So she'll like like and share everything. And she has no idea what any of this stuff yeah. is. She just does it. Amazing how that me. could be the case for both things. <laughs> yeah, Super like, supportive. No clue. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Thank you, mom. Um, I don't know. I guess where where should we start? I did. Well, I don't think the guy actually wants to be Kyle, which is why we're just stumbling around here like three morons, <laughs> not even <laughs> coming close to answering this email. I would say on the on-air, off-air thing, though, years ago, I would have said, you need to pick one. Okay. Pick one because I will admit when I was younger and I would see the behind the scenes guy who was at ESPN and I'd be like, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think they're just going to be down a shift one day and then you're going to be on the air? Like it's not going. And then the rules just kind of changed pretty quickly. And now I wouldn't discourage anyone from any of that. Although still my favorite, maybe my favorite ESPN radio memory. And this is saying something is the guys who just behind the scenes started a podcast in the ESPN main feed and it ran. Like it is it is so incredible to have the balls to go, hey, there's all this equipment around. I've got shit to say. <laughs> That's a 2 a.m. conversation. <laughs> and all of a Blow. sudden it's yep. like <laughs> it's Zach Lowe, Fantasy, Ryan Rosillo, three dudes that were here on a Saturday. Yep. And it's just yep. in the feed. Unbelievable ball. I aspire right? to have that kind of just yeah. no fucks. Just was that a huge problem? Or did no one know for just, a while? I don't even remember I think how it many was episodes discouraged. I got out. Yeah, there's a few episodes and then finally someone was like, what the fuck is this? Who are the what is going on here? Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, the guys that kind of the board ops launched a pod. <laughs> <laughs> on the number one trying to go above and beyond <laughs> sports network in the world anyway uh yeah like i said i i would probably tell you you know if you're cheating on one it's hard to be married 
to the other. But now I don't really feel that way anymore. I, I think I'm less discouraging because I just feel like the paths are all over the place. And I'm from a different time where the path was very clear and very regimented. This is like the one thing that you had to do. And that was so I, I don't want to give that advice now because it doesn't apply. But as far as the Kyle part of it, this emailer, Kyle, feels like, you, as you said, <laughs> you should be asked, like, you don't want to do what he's doing. It seems like his aspirations are beyond what your role is. Totally. So I don't, I don't, I, I don't think he would want to actually like. What is your week? How about we do that? What is your week? Uh, let's see. Sunday, Bill after football, and it's, it's odd hour. Sunday, Bill after football. Now it's Monday mornings with you. Then I'll jump over with Tate, do one shining podcast, put that out. Uh, Tuesdays, Bill, you know, spotty recordings throughout the day. If it's NBA on call, season, like a doctor. Yep. Yep. So no frolic Tuesdays, Thursdays, uh, Wednesday is going to be, frolic. now it's just you. Uh, and I used to like actually do the editing and mixing and now we got work on. So I just kind of pop in and pop out, uh, for that. And then, so Wednesdays are clear, usually a golf day. Uh, Thursday is another bill Thursday night football. If it's good, we'll be recording after the game as well. But again, that's a couple couple different recordings throughout the day friday it will be just this usually a one shiny podcast is banked and out already and then saturday i'm off and sunday we start it all over again but to also to kyle's credit like i've funneled many a producer kyle's way to be like hey could you help them like figure out how to make stuff sound better because kyle's a good editor uh you know we use pro tools and it's not the easiest thing in the world to learn and there's a lot of like different plugins and stuff that you got to figure out and a lot of it's like you know, fine tuning by ear of what you think will work and what won't work. And, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of nail that stuff down. And that is actually, that is very true. Kyle, like Kyle, one of the things that he does that is hard to replicate is like, he just gets stuff out quick, like on bill stuff on a coming on after an NBA finals game or coming on on a Sunday after football, like that pot has to come out fast. Like it, it, we want to be out first before other stuff or like as soon as any reaction pod, you want it out fast. And it's not, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do for sure. And, you know, so Kyle is, Kyle is also, he's a, he's a teacher at this point. I feel like you teach people how to like do that. Yeah. Well, the secret is it's kind of easy after a while. That's <laughs> yeah, we well, that. I, well, it's just, I, it's to the point where I'm just timing it now. I'm like, man, if we can get this out in 38 minutes, that'd be like a new, that's my gym. He's setting personal right? records, my PRing gym. left yeah. and right. Yeah. yeah I'm PRing <laughs> yeah. every week. The th yeah. Yeah. The thing to your point, Ryan, though, about like people and like the, 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 blurred lines between on air and producer stuff. Like, I think I could say this to you, Kyle. Um, like, I don't know if like the Kyle Crichton show is a thing that we would do. Like it, it'd be tough. I, I think there's several reasons it wouldn't do that. I don't even think you would. I don't even think you would want, <laughs> do you that. want I think it. They would yeah. need a full, a full time moderator. Be like, we need to listen to this thing before it goes out. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But, maybe, yeah. I, maybe by month two, I'm out of ideas. And it's just like, why'd you bring the guy from the bar on? It's like, we ran out of stuff. Allison didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Allison didn't think Charles Barkley wanted to talk to you. So uh, we just started bringing uh, Alan from the bar. So, but, uh, yeah, I don't think that's the, right. the light. But like the stuff you bring on life advice, like people, people love you on life advice. The amount of people that yeah, I'm like, oh, dose. what's Kyle like in real life? Like that we, you know, if there aren't those blurred lines, we don't necessarily get that. So um, I'm not really, again, we're not really answering this guy's question. It, it's, it's, it's <laughs> Classic this, I feel like, yeah, but I feel like in this industry, like, I don't know, man, like when we all have these weird different paths of how we kind of got here and a lot of it, some of it's luck. Like I got really lucky to just, you know, obviously get in the mix with you and Ryan when I was, you know, 23 years old. Are you and Scott when I was 23 years old? Like sometimes it just things work out that way. I, what I could say and I always tell people is if you're good at content and you're smart and you're, I don't know, you, you have you bring good ideas to the table, and you give a shit, likely things are going to work out for you. So that's that's kind of how I would how I would uh, how I would approach the, the situation. Did you just say you're smart? Uh, <laughs> Did you just compliment your intelligence? Yeah. Oh, so you think it's no, guys, look, dumb you guys actually, never self admit they're dumb, by the way. Yeah. The other thing. Um, <laughs> no, but it's true. It's everything you said is true. It was your instincts. Immediately with content, your instincts shined. So when we sit in the pre show meeting, and with me, it usually takes a few moments where I have to go, hey, you know who's actually like not a fucking idiot? Is that Saruti guy. So um, yeah, don't be difficult to work with, you know? What an uplifting Say segment. yes to a lot of stuff early on. Nice. Say something yeah, nice I also Ryan, think. Steve. What's that? Say something nice about Ryan, so we can just get it all. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we don't. We don't need to. I got complimented a couple weeks. Got ago. Got a nice, nice boat. 
a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I'm like a camel with that shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, after that forever. <laughs> we spent a lot, a lot of time on that, and I don't, I don't know. I don't think we, we answer anything. But there is no answer. I don't know. It's, it's hard. There is no answer. Which Very is philosophical. Next? I just think to ask, hey, I want to be like Kyle, and it feels like you are way more motivated to, not that Kyle's not motivated, but Kyle has different goals than the emailer. You actually don't want to be like Kyle. And I don't mean that as an insult to Kyle, right, Kyle? We're on the same page here. Yeah, like, hard to make that sound good, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, right. Didn't sound good when I said it out loud. You sound way more motivated than Kyle. So <laughs> you, got your, you got your shit figured out. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Let's let's move on. Let's from this. Should I eat my neighbor's pets? Okay, topical. <laughs> oh. Uh-oh. All right, now that I have your attention, my English teacher would be proud of that hook. What's up guys? I guess this is where I tell you I'm 6 foot 165, no gym stats, but I'm up typically around the 90th percentile of the Peloton leaderboard on a good day. Anyway, here's my issue. The people who own the house across the street from me recently moved out and renters moved in. The renters have, to my knowledge, four dogs, a rooster, and God knows what else living with them. Yes, a goddamn rooster. No, I do not live on a farm. We're talking a standard suburban neighborhood where the houses are fairly close together and the yards are modestly sized. As far as I know, the rooster lives in the house with them and the other animals but I've seen it casually hanging out in their front yard while the female woman who lives there mows the lawn. The rooster isn't even the problem, though. I'm not waking up to cock-a-doodle-doo at, uh, at the crack of dawn every morning like I'm sure you're envisioning. The rooster seems pretty chill. All caps. It's the dogs. These dogs are louder and are given more free reign than the literal farm animal. One of them is the little yappy asshole variety for whatever reason, they think it's a good idea to let it roam around in their front yard off leash. Sometimes they'll be out there with it, though not paying attention. And other times it'll be completely unsupervised. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't choose to just hang out in the shade and keep to itself. This is the kind of dog that will bark at everything it sees. will lose its shit if you dare to exist on your own property. It will come into my yard and try to start shit with my dog when he's in our fenced-in backyard. It's even followed my family and me to the end of the street. We've gone out for a walk, yapping its head the whole way, even when they have it in their backyard, which is fenced, by the way. It's so small and dumb that it easily gets under the fence whenever it wants to go terrorize someone. The other dogs bark just as much, but they're actual dogs and not cats pretending to be dogs, so they're fortunately confined to the backyard at least. Now, I understand that the dogs are going to bark. It's sort of their thing, but what bothers me is they clearly do not care. Not only do they not bring the dogs inside when they're all barking incessantly, including at night, every night, like right fucking now, as he's writing the email, they even let the dogs stay outside when they're not home. Oh, oh geez. That's bullshit, yeah. Yeah, it's not like they're outdoor dogs, which shouldn't even be a thing. They just don't care that much. You, know, you want to know why? It's because they don't want the dogs inside trashing their house. Think yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, that much is clear by... Them allowing Sir Yaps a lot to freely roam the neighborhood. So what do I do? I've never met these people, by the way. They aren't home a lot and frankly didn't make a great first impression. So I wasn't exactly rushing over a plate of fresh baked cookies. Do I do the adult thing and go over there and respectfully ask them to keep their dogs inside more often? Do I write a passive aggressive note? Do I meal prep and give Fox News something to talk about? Whoa. <laughs> or I just suck it up and deal with it for the next year or however long these people stay i would appreciate any advice okay um you've got to you've got to go into action here okay action i'm going to say this and it's assumption but i feel good these are probably not the most intelligent people you're ever <laughs> going to encounter okay they're probably dumb people so when you go to war with dumb be ready all right um yes we could do the polling of one, which I despise, or somebody emails in, like, I have four dogs, and it's totally fine. Well, congrats to you and your four yeah. fucking dogs, and everything's sweet. But more mm -hmm. often than not, I would imagine if you have four dogs and a rooster, and you're in a small neighborhood, it's not going to be sweet, all right? I, I don't need to look at a pie chart. I don't need to get the Pew Institute on that. Um, my guess would be, more often than not, it isn't very sweet. And the fact that they don't care so much to then leave the dogs outside because they can't fuck up their place, right? They're inside, and they're living in there. You are going to be battling with people that don't care. They don't have any consideration for other people. They don't understand decency. So you need to be ready. Passive aggressive note, waste of time. Yep. If you want to use it as like the verbal warning or the, the memo from HR, like you are parking in the wrong spot too many times. Here's your first warning on file, that kind of thing. You could do it. 
doesn't really matter. You go over and talk to them. They're going to tell you to fuck off and they're going to make fun of you when you leave the house. So it sounds like in a small neighborhood, it's about community. It's about, and I don't love going. Yeah. I don't, (laughs) I don't love this move, right? Because it happened to your boy Rosillo when we had the pony show up to the Kentucky Derby party. And there was one angsty neighbor who was upset. I didn't invite his kids over to pet the pony. Um, he didn't ask if his kids had come over. You think I would have turned kids away? I fucking love kids. Nobody <laughs> podcast likes kids as much as me. All right. Wait, are you suggesting a secret meeting like Sons of Liberty style? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm saying you start like the UN. You just start going door to door and be like, where are you on uh, the dog farm over there? <laughs> That's how revolutions right? get started. Yeah, exactly. Um, you need allies right now. And then I think phase two is once you feel like you've built up enough, your legion is strong, your reserves are ready, at the ready, I should say, um, you have to just make these people so miserable they're going to move. But you know what? They may not ever move because some fucking guy was willing to rent out his house to people with four dogs and a fucking rooster. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think a hundred percent, this is all, a lot of this hinges on the approach, right? If you, if you start the approach, I don't think wrong, it matters. I, I well, think they're immune to right, any assume, approach. Well, you're assuming a lot. These could be people that are unaware. Maybe they came from a city or something and they're like, it's noisy everywhere. What the fuck? You know, they came maybe from a city. I don't four know. Dogs, four dogs. And a rooster? I don't know. Maybe they got excited and they're like, we can have a rooster now. Fuck it. Let's get some dogs. I don't, I don't <laughs> maybe, know. Maybe, maybe the rooster was post city. You're right. Maybe, I don't know. It's possible. <laughs> I, I just I think the 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 note is unless you're going to like start wasting police time and, and money by calling them every time it's, you know, 10 o'clock and the dogs are barking for, you know, longer than two minutes, whatever. I don't know if there's a rule when it becomes an actual thing. But unless you're going to do that, I think the note is not good. Um, I wonder if you could go like, did the people sell the house and move or do they just move and rent the house? Can you talk to the can you talk? He to said the it's owner? a rental. So could you talk to do you, if you know the owner? Can you find out? Can you just be like, listen, can you be the bad guy? And I'm not the one who has to worry about them like making stink bombs out of my mailbox because they didn't like that I, you know, whatever. Uh, so like, if you if you want to keep yourself anonymous, maybe you could call, find out who the owner of is. It's the same people that just moved out and started renting, or if it's sold or whatever. Maybe you can go there. Let that be the bad guy. They might be breaking their lease. I don't know if there's rooster clauses in most leases, but usually there's some sort of pet. I mean, if you want to rent an actual house where I live, it says no pets half the time, no smoking, no yeah. pets. So, uh, like that's, that, that could be, they could be totally breaking their lease there or not, but you, so maybe you just go to the people who actually own the house and let them be the bad guys. I would say that's the first thing I would do before I start, you know, I rounding up the troops. I think that's the right call because make, you know, do they, are they, can you see them doing anything that is negative to the property? Like you can kind of play that in too and be like, Hey, you know, they're tearing up the yard and the dogs are, you know, ruining the fence or, you know, the, the, the rooster, there's just shit everywhere. Like you could make it worth the landlord's while to be like, what the heck's going on over there? Maybe they don't know, but I would be a pain in the ass to the landlord because what's, you know, what's he going to do other than try to fix it? If you keep bothering him, I would imagine he's not going to enjoy that. And then you don't have to deal with the face to face contact from the people that you don't even want to deal with, which are the dog owners. This sucks because like, you know, the, the, the email has a dog too. So it's not like they're an anti dog person. Although it sounds like they don't like little dogs. And I, I would tell you, dachshunds are, are actually pretty cool dogs. So, I'm, well, it maybe. sounds like this dog sucks based on the evidence. Maybe, so, maybe, yeah. but the, like all dogs, any dog, any kind of breed sucks. They, they all have negative, positives, and negatives. If you don't train them properly, and clearly none of these dogs seem like trained, they probably just get let outside and they do what they want. I'm surprised my, she's even mowing her lawn with four dogs romping around all the time. Yeah, like, just, what could be left? Imagine the seating. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. Natural fertilizer. There you go. I think um, once you put a face to the name, if you're the if like if you're upset, even if everyone else is upset, once you put a face to the to them and they're like, that's the guy that hates me. If yeah. other people start bothering things, so like that's the one, the one re is like these people are renters, they're probably not in for the long haul. They're definitely, you know, they they could leave at any time. It's not like it's not like, oh, we're gonna be stuck with these people for 20 years. So they might not be interested in putting down good roots with everyone. So I just think if you decide to like go over there and have a conversation, we're assuming a lot about these people. They might be cool. They'd be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. But I think once you put a, like you're the guy who's upset, if other people in the neighborhood start doing stuff like calling cops, you just might get the bad rap and then they might yeah. just have this vendetta for you and they might be willing to do shit you're not willing to do. So uh, I, I mean, maybe that's the scary version of it where I, maybe I'm assuming a lot, but I would definitely try to go to the landlord first. Once they know you're the guy that's got a problem with them, they might just start blaming you for everything that happens. <laughs> yeah. 
But does that really matter, though, like if, if they're renting and if they are clearly in the wrong? So like, for example, my at my old house, I've told the story I had by my neighbor. We didn't really like each other. Uh, but I also kind of found out that nobody else in the neighborhood liked this person either. Guy, right? Yeah. Uh, so we had dogs. They would bark. I mean, you know, dogs bark, whatever. I don't leave them outside for hours barking. They'd bark maybe for five minutes during the course of a day. And he would complain about it. He's called a cop. He had called the cops before. It's he's just he's just a curmudgeon. It is what it is. Talk to the neighbor behind me who had lived there long before we did. And they're like, oh, yeah, same shit happened to us. He called the cops. The lady was like, I was afraid he was going to drop like, you know, a piece of steak with some rat poison in it because he was like that scary of a dude. So you're like, oh, I'm not the crazy person. That guy's the crazy person. So I feel like even if you're the 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 face of whatever, you know, bad thing to these people, it doesn't matter because you're right and they suck. So who cares? What are they going to do to you? I mean, it, can it get any worse? Like, what are they going to put the dogs in your yard? So I think there's a list of stuff that that would suck that they could do. But I, I mean, if they're saying. total wild cards, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> that's like, what well, I mean. maybe. But I don't know. At least you'd know who to then. Then you have a real like, you know, a rooster is a wild card. If you bring a rooster into the suburbs, <laughs> that's an absolute wild card. Even with roosters, yeah, you, you, they could, they're, they're capable of anything. Those really. are like yeah. the black Air Force ones of uh, neighbors. You're like, I yeah. don't know what that guy's capable of. Just These so, people don't even clean out their it. lint in the dryer. No, no, no definitely not. not. No, yep. they don't do that. Um, I hate to even bring this up because we know my position on PHOA. Over <laughs> okay, what are you going to say? H-O-A. I don't know. I, I, if it's just a neighborhood and there's no HOA, then there's no HOA, and there's actually a lot of great things about that. But if there were one, it's like, what do we pay you for? You're supposed to get involved. I know me suggesting HOA as a solution is like Logan Roy vacationing with Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I don't know. I don't rent an HOA. I mean, you, no, can, you, like, you, can could, you rent a house in an HOA? I, I don't know. I guess maybe. Yes. I, yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's different limitations on it. Actually, the first place I lived in in Manhattan Beach, it was like a five person HOA. And then I was renting it out when I moved. And then the other four people voted that no one could rent out anything anymore. I was like, gee, that seems rather targeted. It's <laughs> like, you guys really just did that. They're like, well, you didn't show up to the meeting. I was like, we, cause I went to a couple of them fucking sat there for two and a half hours talking about gutters and shit. Like I got stuff to do. It's games on a two hour, five person meeting. That sounds awful. They were so long. I was like, I'm not doing these again. Pretty brutal. Yeah. And that's what happens, you know, lose your vote. There's a lesson in there. You know, don't take the <laughs> right, don't take dude. the right to vote lightly. <laughs> Next thing you, know, you come back, like, what are the new rules? Like, oh, so the rules about my unit, mine. I was like, great. And then the anyway, the last renter I had in there was such an asshole that I mean, they took the mattress covers off the mattresses, piss stains on them, ruined multiple pieces of furniture. Uh, I mean, it was it was a joke. And it just makes you go like, I never want to do this again. And what the fuck is this? This question is not about renting out properties. Um, man, long life advice. Yeah. Not great. Let's end it right now. Thanks to Kyle. <laughs> thanks to Oregon. Thanks to Saruti. Uh, fix some better emails next week. <laughs> Ryan Russillo yeah. Podcast, Ringer Spotify. <laughs>